I'm not a morning person. Dedicated to being passionate about it. Bodybuilders have become more lazy. People have always thought I lift fake weights. Iran and the United States. You take, you take responsibility for that. So Jerry, how you been? It's been like a couple of years since we last spoke. Well, you know, just hanging in there. You know, I got uh, about, uh, what was it, uh, two years ago, I got a bad case of diverticulitis that put me in the hospital. What is that exactly? It's basically uh, diverticuli are these little out pouches in the intestines, and uh, sometimes they get infected. And when that happens, you get diverticulitis. It's a horrendous, horrendous stomach pain. It was. I thought I was going to die. My stomach was sticking oh my God. up. A woman. And uh, what happened was I had to be hospitalized for about nine days. And I, I didn't eat any food. They put me on an IV, you know, and uh, I dropped, believe it or not, 23 pounds in nine days. And it was all muscle. I mean, the cortisol levels were going through the roof. I, had, I asked them to give me an insulin shot, believe it or not, just to stop the muscle loss. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've never taken it. So <laughs> I felt like one of the bodybuilders in there. But the thing is, uh, I, when I got out, this is the interesting thing. It, it, uh, my, my arms and legs in particular were just so atrophied. Uh, you know, I went back to the gym and it took me about six months to gain some of the muscle back, most of it. But the strange part is, it's been over two years now, about two and a half years, I've never gotten my strength fully back. Never got the strength back. Wow, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it just did something to me where I, I you know, I'm, I'm just much weaker than I was before I went in the hospital. Uh, how, did, how, how did you get this condition, this disease? How, how, how does one get that? It's a genetic thing. I mean, you inherit these things. They're just like I say. They're normally little outpouchings. They they just normally don't do anything. You know, mm -hmm. he, uh, I believe my, my one of my grandmothers had it. I might have you know inherited. It. It's like a time bomb. You know, it sits in your body, and sometimes you can go throughout life and nothing will ever happen. Other times, you know, it'll get infected for and who knows why. I mean, I did everything right. I ate a high fiber diet. You know, I mean, I was eating red meat at the time. That's a minor risk factor. But it's not considered a major risk factor. Uh, but so, you know, I did everything right from a health point of view. I exercised. Wow. All that are supposed to prevent it, but I got it anyway because uh, I think basically a lot of it had to do with my age. Mm -hmm. It tends to show up when you get older. In other words, mm -hmm. you can go, it very rarely shows up when you're younger. So it was just something kind of, you know, ready to go. It was just. <laughs> are, you, um, are you vegan now or something like that? You stop eating red meat? I'm not vegan completely, but I uh, I did cut out. I, I've been meaning to cut out red meat, mm -hmm. not for health reasons, but for ethical reasons, because I'm kind of an animal advocate. Mm -hmm. And I, I did an article once on, on uh, grass-fed beef, and when I researched and found out about these so-called uh, factory farms, the way they treat cattle, it just it was horrible. I, I I mean, it was just absolutely devastating. And I always swore one of these days I'm going to cut out meat. I just don't like uh, eating animals like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I already cut out pork because I know it sounds funny. I like pigs. I really I like them. I'd like to have a pig as a pet. <laughs> I think they're very smart. Yeah, very they're cute. I could to me eating a pig was like eating a human. I couldn't do it. So mm -hmm. I cut out stuff like bacon already a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So I got out of the hospital. When I was in the hospital, I had nothing to do but lie in bed. I had my phone with me, so I was able to read up on. Uh, Diverticulitis. I read about 50 medical journal articles. By the time I got out of the hospital, I knew about as much about it as any doctor. Wow. And I, that's when I realized, I, you know, I noticed that red meat was considered uh, eating red meat was considered a minor risk factor. So I said, all right, here's my opportunity. I'm going to cut out red meat, and I did. I haven't eaten red meat since then. Mm -hmm. uh, I, eat a, I eat a little bit of chicken. Uh -huh. I eat cheese, uh, and uh, that's about it. The, and then I have a, you know, protein whey whey protein. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it's vegetables and fruit. That's it, you know. So I'm kind of not 100 percent, but I'm you know leaning towards it. You know, you brought up the whole uh, grass-fed beef, right? Like I was talking to somebody recently about that. You know, when you go to the supermarket now, you see organic products, you see cage-free chickens, you see a grass-fed beef. You know, you see all these things like, and, and it makes it look more humane, right? For that, like it makes you as a consumer much, much. You feel better by getting that type of stuff for health reasons, for humane reasons, right? Now you saying that um, it's just basically just uh, are those real things? Are they really more humane treatments for animals in those conditions? And are they better for you those products? Well, certain certain one, for, uh, well the cage free stuff is is controversial because a lot of that's fake. In other words, what they what they'll do is uh, normally chickens are penned so tight mm -hmm. that they can't move. It's like a, a horrible torture. Mm -hmm. With the cage free, they'll let the ch a, pig, uh, a lot of oftentimes. They'll let the chickens out of the cage for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. and by doing that, they could call it cage-free. It's mm -hmm. completely fake. In other words, you're paying premium prices, but you're not really getting cage-free. 
The only way to really be sure that you're getting cage-free chicken, I mean eggs, is to actually get it from a farmer. I know it sounds funny. A lot of people aren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I would say a good percentage of so-called cage-free are not really cage-free. So you're mm -hmm. just getting, you're buying regular eggs and they're charging you twice as much, three times as much money, whatever. As far as the grass-fed beef, there is something nutritionally to that. Uh, I mean, they still kill the cow, so it's not that humane. I mean, but the point is, they let the cow out in the pasture. It's not penned up, and uh, as a result, it, the cow gets a more varied diet. Than, usually, they give them stuff like crappy soy grits and all that. And, mm -hmm. and the, the quality, the nutritional quality of the meat mm -hmm. of a grass-fed cow is higher than regular meat. And uh, for example, it has a lot more of what they call conjugated linoleic acid, <laughs> CLA. It has some health benefits and this and that. So mm -hmm. the grass beef, uh, beef is definitely superior mm -hmm. to red beef, but I, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't actually call it humane again because this still involves the killing of cattle. They might maybe they do it in a little bit better way, but you know, killing is killing. What are you going to say? You know, for you sure. The knife for a gun, you're still killing it. You know. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, what about you know? I, I read somewhere and I saw this documentary on YouTube. I think a while ago. Uh, if you get like if you get like you know like cheaper chicken like those big chicken breasts you know those come from chickens that are literally just in a cage they cut their beaks off those chickens never walk on the ground literally right is that that's true right that is true that is true and also what they do with the chicks is horrible the little babies they throw them in a grinder while they're alive it's horrendous that's one of the things I found out when I did the uh, fact the uh, grass fed beef I, I, you know they take little baby chicks they throw them in a, uh, in a grind them while they're alive. They just pour them right in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I'm, I don't know how people could walk around. And do, and I couldn't do that mm -hmm. for any amount of money. I could, I could never, I could never do that. I, I mean, I understand it's a job to these guys, but sure. Certain like like those guys who up in the uh, Canada and the, where, where they shoot the baby seals. You know, I, I heard that they're cutting down that uh, over the years. They're reducing that, but that's something I couldn't do. Somebody said to me once, "Well, Jerry, these guys are fishermen, and you know they got to support their families." I said, well, to me, I'd have to get a different job. I'm not going to kill baby seals. Uh, you know, I don't care if I have five kids, whatever. I could not live with myself. You know what I mean? So these guys have a different type of mentality than me. That's all I can say. Sure. <laughs> but how can you be a, a bodybuilder, right? If you're in the bodybuilding industry, right, obviously. How can you be a bodybuilder and still be humane and still, you got to eat chicken and beef, right? I mean, you, it's, it's you know. Difficult. You, know the, you know, the funny thing is I would normally have agreed with you readily a couple of years ago. Uh, but you're, the truth is, if you look at it from a purely nutritional sense, you could actually be a vegan and be a, uh, a vegan. I always mispronounce. I think it's vegan. You can always be a vegan and be a successful bodybuilder. It just takes a little more research and study to ensure that you're getting all the nutrients. And again, a couple of years ago, it would have been much more difficult. But now they have these kind of vegetable-based protein powders like sure. hemp and pea and rice. Sure. And the thing is, in the studies that I've written about this. Uh, the only difference between them and whey is they don't have quite as much amino acids as whey. But now let's say you take uh, two scoops of, let's say, pea protein or wet ripe rice protein. Well, it turns out that that has, enough, has the same amount of amino acids as the whey. So all, all you got to do is double it up. And that makes it a lot easier because what you're saying is true. Bodybuilders do need a lot more protein. And if you try to get it strictly from fruits and vegetables, that's a lot of, I mean, it's, that is really hard to do. Right. In fact, I, I would say it's almost nearly, very, very difficult to do. But with the advent of these, again, vegetable-based uh, protein uh, supplements, it's not hard at all. So, and, and then the other thing you'd have to look for is to ensure that you get the nutrients that are not in the, the vegan diet, like B12, iron. Uh, you'd probably have to get iodine. There's a couple of other ones. But it's also, isn't it, isn't it a question of texture? Because I, I remember talking to this bodybuilder a long time ago, right? He told me he, he went dieting just on fish. And he said he couldn't get the hardness of the muscle the same way he got from beef and chicken. Is it about texture something to do with it too, though, of the actual protein? The texture, like, you know, the meat. I, I would say in the case of the fish, it's probably the fact that it's so low in fat. Now, you look at fish, it has no carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And if you eat a really lean fish you're getting very little fat. I mean, it's like one gram. It's like nothing. So you're basically, the guy's eating pure protein. So by doing that, I mean, he, he could get sliced because he's forcing his body to use up all the fat that's on his body. So, I mean, uh, I mean, sometimes it could get to extreme. I mean, I don't know if you saw this uh, recent video that Ronnie Coleman did where he said he's 0.33, you know, when he was in contest condition, 
at 280 pounds, I had to laugh. I like Ronnie Coleman. I, I know him, and I, I think he's a great guy. Uh, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Mr. Olympia. But he makes a statement that he was 0.33% body fat. You don't believe him? Physically impossible. It's physically. <laughs> no, no, because here's the deal. A man has what they call 3% essential fat. Now, uh, essential fat on his body. What that means is that 3% fat, the body doesn't want to touch. That's what supports your internal organs. It so supports- three is the minimum. 3% is the minimum. Three is the minimum. Uh, the fat that surrounds your nerves, and my all this is related to that essential fat. You start to burn away that eventual, uh, essential fat. As soon as you go below 3%, things happen. For one thing, you and they showed this with some, uh, actually some Navy SEALs years ago. Mm-hmm. They actually went down below 3%. As soon as they drop below 3% fat, they started cannibalizing their muscle. Muscles were burning away. I mean, because what's happening is the body senses that the body fat's too low. It starts to burn tissues like crazy. If you try to go even below that, let's say you head for one percent, mm-hmm. then you're gonna get. Then you're gonna turn off your immune system, and it's almost like you have COVID nineteen. You're gonna die as soon as you run into somebody who has some sort of disease. They're not gonna be able to treat you. You have no immunity. So you know, to say you're zero point three, a skeleton has more fat than that because the fat's in the bone marrow. So it's, you know, it's, and then when he said he was 3% fat when he was off season. If you, if you ever, I'm sure you've seen photos of him off season, 320 pounds. He looked like a walking, uh, what is it called? Uh, Michelin man. I mean, he was gigantic, but he had the big pot belly and stuff. That's not 3% fat. You, you, you know, you've heard of Andreas Munzer, the bodybuilder. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, he was probably the most ripped bodybuilder ever. I interviewed the guy several times. Very nice guy. Mm-hmm. I asked him in an interview, have you ever had, and this guy was sliced. I remember when I was talking to him, his skin looked like it was transparent. You could actually, when he moved his hand, you could see muscle fibers jumping around in his arm. That's how cut he was. Oh. Veins every. I said, Andreas, did you ever have your body fat measured? He says, yes. I said, what was it? 5%. Mm. And look, that man had no fat at all. And that's fine. And Ronnie Coleman is saying he's 3%. Sorry, I like what's Ronnie. um, <laughs> what's wanna, you, well, no, no, just to be fair, Vlad, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to say that whoever measured his fat, you know, sometimes these these body fat tests they depend on water content, and bodybuilders have unusual water content, like where, where for example, before a show, that as you know, they're very dehydrated. Right. A lot of the guys take diuretic, so that makes these these uh these typical body composition it throws them off. So they get these weird figures. Mm-hmm. So I'm giving Ronnie the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to say that whoever told them that the, these figures of zero, they didn't measure them correctly because it's it's not possible. It's just not possible. What's, gener- yeah. what's generally the body fat percentage of a uh, average bodybuilder that goes on the stage? All right, a, a ripped bodybuilder will be a, a anywhere from five to seven percent. I'm talking shredded, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the, 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 there's probably a couple of rare guys that may get down to. Maybe four mm-hmm. percent, uh, and the even rarer three percent. Mm-hmm. But at three percent, they can't stay at that way at that level too long, and they usually don't. The guys that get down to three percent, those are the guys who, after the show, right. you, you see them blow up really fast because their body reacts again. Mm-hmm. You know, it starts to lay down fat a lot faster because they, it kind of senses that the essential fat is, you know, it's it's too it's dangerously low. So uh, I, again, I would say. Most of the really shredded bodybuilders are five to seven percent fat, mm-hmm. uh, veering towards the five percent. But a lot of these guys lie about their. Uh, I've seen the you know their interviews and their articles where they're talking about being two percent fat. What they're full of crap. They're not one percent fat. I, I guarantee it. They're not. Mm-hmm. It's not possible. I was. They wouldn't look. They wouldn't look to, I'm telling you, at one percent fat, they would not look good. Trust right, me. Right. Right. I was talking to a doctor recently, and he told me that basically, if naturally you can't, your body fat percentage can be, like, like basically genetic is like you mentioned genetics, right? Like, some people have easier way, is easier um, time to lose uh, body fat, and some very difficult. You know what I'm saying? But he was saying that basically, if you can't be just maintaining your body fat percentage, let's say under 15 percent, like naturally, yeah. that means basically that. You always got to starve yourself. You always got to be on a diet, and you just can't enjoy your life. Like some people just can't have that body fat low, no matter what they do. That's very true, and, and I and I can tell you why. It has to do with the nature of the fat cells themselves. Uh, uh, you have something called hypertrophic hyperplastic obesity. What that means, in simple terms, is the fat cells are both lo- are both larger and more numerous. Hmm. So, in other words, if you have the genetics, unfortunately, I have that. 
In other words, it, a lot of it has to do with your parents. Mm -hmm. If you come to, let's say, obese parents, mm -hmm. uh, and especially the way your mother e eats when you're pregnant also has a lot to do with it, you're going to be born with a greater number and a, and a greater number and greater size fat cells. Fortunately, unfortunately, it stays with you for life. And what this means is these individuals are going to have a much harder time getting ripped, much harder time. Mm -hmm. The kids that really get ripped are the lucky ones who are born with small fat cells and less fat cells. Those are the guys that look like they never get fat, you know. And there's other, there's also, uh, in more recent years, we realize that there's other factors involved too. For example, there's something called brown adipose tissue or BAT. Now, this is basically a thermogenic tissue. It, it, uh, it's kind of, kind of reddish in color because it contains more mitochondria. Now, the significance of that is the mitochondria is the portion of the cell where fat is actually burned. So the more mitochondria you have and muscles and anywhere else, the more fat you're going to be able to burn, see? So these people, they, they thought for years that only babies had a significant amounts of fat because that's the only way they could, they could keep their bodies warm. Mm -hmm. So that once you started to grow, you know, the the, the uh, uh, bat or brown adipose tissue basically disappeared. That's what they thought for years. And then a couple of years ago, they discovered quite a few adults had significant amounts of brown adipose tissue. <laughs> what that means is that if you have a lot of active brown adipose tissue, I'm not going to say that you'll never get fat, mm -hmm. but in other words, you'd have to basically go out of your way. These are the people that kind of, you can see them like eating pizza and a lot of stuff. They don't seem to get fat. Everybody knows somebody like that. Mm -hmm. where they, you know, A lot of them don't even work out. They'll just eat whatever they want, and they don't seem to get fat. You say, what is this guy? You know, how can he stay, you know, lean like that? Right. This is the answer. Brown adipose tissue. Interesting. <laughs> what, what about also, I noticed some people get sort of like, they get fat in certain regions, right? Some on the chest, some got yeah. love handles, some got like lower stomach problems. So, and, and I read that you can't isolate like fat burn in certain areas, right? So, yeah. how, so how do you deal with those areas where, let's say, you get, you gain, you seem to be getting fat in certain regions? Okay. That's true, and that is genetically based. Right. Some people get fat in some areas. My problem when I was a bodybuilding competitor was always the obliques and lower back. In other words, I could get all the fat off my body. Those are the ones that came. That was always stubborn. I had to get way, way down in body fat. It was torturous to me mm -hmm. because I'd, I'd have like the thick, you know, really ripped abs, mm -hmm. and yet I'd have still have a little, you know, stuff on my lower back. And so, so it drive me crazy. But you know, that's genetically based, uh, and as you point out correctly. There's no such thing as spot, spot reducing. All these guys that are doing like a thousand sit-ups a day, thinking it's gonna, you know, right. get rid of the fat. So what do, what do you do? What do you do to reduce those those spots? Okay. What you, all you can do is go on a diet, exercise, and just drop fat from diet, exercise. Mm. Eventually, uh, and I tell this to women too, because you know women have the problem with the, you know, the hip and the buttocks right. and the mm -hmm. upper thigh. You know, they, they call it cellulite and all this and that and. You know, they always say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm lean everywhere, but I got the fat there. What do I do? Mm -hmm. I say, just continue to exercise and diet. Eventually, when you get, when your body fat, overall body fat gets lean, it gets low enough, your body's going to tap into that last bit of fat. And that's the same thing for the men. If they stay on the diet and exercise long enough, they will get rid of all the local deposit. But there's no way, like if you have like fatty pecs, you can't do high rep flies. It's not going to help. You know, it's it's not going to do anything. Right? You you have to diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, some areas are more easy than others. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have any trouble bringing my abs out. I could bring them out when I dieted in in uh, six weeks. I had good abs from having no abs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Casey Deater, famous bodybuilder years ago, I saw him show up in the gym with a pot belly, out of shape. And three months later, he was competing. And he got third in the Olympia That's with amazing. veins going through his abs. Mm -hmm. So and he didn't do a single sit up, by the way. Wow. I always tell people that this man did not do any abdominal work at all, and his abs were great. So it was pure diet and exercise. That's all he did. Mm -hmm. and, this, and the same goes for anybody else. So that's something you get rid of. Those. Eventually, if you stay, if you have the willpower, and again, you know, it, it'll take a little long. You know, you'll be, uh, let's say, you have, wherever the stubborn fat deposits, you'll get rid of the fat in all the other areas, and you'll still have that fat. You got to stick to it. If you, you know, if you have the willpower, they will be, you know, disappear eventually. How do you feel about this? A lot of treatments recently. It's called fat freezing, basically, where they isolate, you know, specific areas. They they, they do some kind of procedure to freeze it, and then eventually those those fat cells they start dying out or something like that. They get burned off. Well, how do you feel about those procedures? Well, at first I I, I thought it was a pretty good idea, but in fact I was going to do an article about it. I you know because I, th I figured this could be a good utility for bodybuilders. You know, mm -hmm. like what like you just what we're talking about. Let's say the guys that have the stubborn uh, 
you know, they're ripped everywhere and they still got a little oblique fat. You know, they don't, you know, you, you, they don't want to risk losing muscle mm -hmm. to keep, you know, losing weight. So maybe they can get the f fat freeze and get rid of the, uh, the problem with that is the side effects that can cause permanent damage to cells. It, it's not as good as they say. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, 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 when I saw the, uh, I read about four journal articles. These are recent, where they talked about uh, uh, you know side effects that didn't initially show up, but they now. Exist. What kind of side effects? Well, they can cause damage to cells. It can actually it can actually permanently damage the cells, uh, and uh, it does something else which I don't recall at the moment. But I, I just remember thinking, no, this I, I can't recommend this stuff. Interesting, because it, it's uh, uh, a lot of people might you know not might not notice it, but. It's not 100% safe, let me put it that way. Mm. I, I couldn't recommend it because of that. That's interesting because those, those treatments are available in so many different places now. All the cities have it pretty much. The, the doctors who, uh, or whoever uh, does that stuff, they make a fortune over it. Right, right, right. I mean, it, it's a very expensive uh, procedure. It's thousands of dollars. Uh, but like I say, uh, everyone who gets that is going to get some cellular damage. There's what? No question. What about liposuction? If if you do a liposuction, let's say around your waist, right, or whatever, in your stomach, and your so, somewhere in your body, right, those those body uh, f cells fat, the, the the fat comes back or no in those areas? Well, the, the original what they originally thought was first of all, you know, there's the only you can only take a limited amount of fat uh, with each liposuction uh, procedure, mm -hmm. but it was formerly thought that once you remove fat in any area, let's say on your bleed, whatever, that that fat never came back because you've actually sucked out the fat cells. Mm -hmm. But if you overeat this is what the, this is what the previous thought was. The fat, you know, you would get fat in the arms everywhere else, but that area would not get fat because you've taken out the fat cell. Well, there's another thing that's changed. They now know that the fat cells can come back. Mm. So it's not a permanent thing. If uh, it definitely does reduce fat, there's no question about it. But if you, for example, uh, it kind of it's kind of reminds me of these heart patients where they have a bypass, mm -hmm. you know, and they think, well, now I can go back to my eating and smoking and do everything because I have a bike. No, what happens when you do that is the bypass uh, closes and you're right back where you started. It's the same with the liposuction. If you eat like a pig and you know uh, don't exercise and eat all this garbage, believe it or not, the fat cells will actually creep back there. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not as perfect as they, as they lead people to believe. Oh, that's interesting. I want to ask you one more one more question about nu nutrition. Actually, um, so you know, when you, again, when you when you go to the store and you buy like you know cheaper priced chicken, right? Or it can be the whole chicken. It can be a chicken breast. Uh, if you look at the ingredients, uh, and I've seen it on, on also on the internet before, basically they inject it with a saline solution. I think it's called, which is basically sodium mixed with some some kind of water or something. And that gives it, a, you know, a, obviously an impression of a bigger, uh, a bigger piece of chicken. You know what I'm saying? Like, how, how bad is that solution really? And you know, eating that is obviously much cheaper to buy that. But like, what, you know, what kind of damage can it cause to your body? If, you know, in the long run. Basically, saline. It's a salt. As as you know, it's basically sodium. So you have to look at it as just extra sodium. So a bodybuilder who's conscious of the sodium intake would have to take measures to. Uh, 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 a lot of times when you cook the chicken, by the way, if you broil it, for example, a lot of that uh, saline solution will come out anyway, right? Mm, okay. A large percentage of it. Secondarily, if, you're, if for whatever reason you're concerned about your sodium intake, even if you're not a bodybuilder, let's say you have hypertension, high blood pressure, or you have a sensitivity to sodium, then you have to take measures to counter that sodium. Uh, nutritionally, you could, for example, potassium. Potassium is the yin to the sodium's yang. When you take potassium, you neutralize the effects of sodium in the body. You actually cause the excretion of sodium. It's a very simple way. Magnesium, calcium, all these things will basically push sodium out of the body. So, you know, it's not really a big problem. And you're, you are correct, though. They, they put that saline in there mm -hmm. to fluff up the chicken to make it look like it's more there, more there than there is. Do you yeah. think sodium in um, – because every time you look at ingredients, right, the sodium is just uh, off the scale sometimes. You know, I was talking to some guys from Europe, and they telling me that in Europe, like in England and France, it's a much lower sodium uh, – you know, contain, the food contains much less sodium, you know, percentage-wise in their food. And it seems like in – you know, you, you go uh, get a pack of turkey, let's say, right? You look in the bag, the sodium is like 600, something like that, milligrams or whatever, right? Uh, why so much sodium in food, do you think? And, and do you think that's, that's bad? or do you, like Because I think the, um, the FDA re uh, recommends eating, what, like 200, uh, 2,000 milligrams of, of sodium a day? 1,500. 1,500, there you go. 
And it seems like some products have like you eat like just a couple of servings and it's already you had that percentage. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the sodium is in there for two reasons. First of all, what you're talking about mostly is processed foods. Right. In other words, natural food does not contain that much sodium, but processed food does. The reason is it's in there for twofold. First, as a partial preservative, it helps to preserve, let's say, uh, delicatessen meats or something like that, like the turkey you mentioned. Hmm. Secondarily, I know it sounds funny, it's added there for taste. It's added to make these meats that are usually are already pre-cooked or something like that. And other foods... Uh, it's not so much active, uh, let's say cereals, whatever that we see a lot of sodium. It's added basically for it for a taste thing more than anything else. I know you, you're probably thinking, why do they need like that so much, much so though? You know, no, I know it, it doesn't make any sense right. from a purely scientific point of view. It doesn't make any sense to add mm. more that much sodium. But again, even in the uh, the sodium has what they call a hydroscopic effect. It actually tends to attract water, and I know this sounds funny. Even if they put it in a dry cereal, it'll actually puff up the cereal and make it look fresher. So mm. that's another reason why they, you know, they put a ton of sodium in. And from a health standpoint, it's not good to have that much sodium. Yeah, I was going to ask you: do, do, do you recommend people follow the FDA recommendation on the sodium intake daily, the fifteen, the fifteen hundred uh, milligrams? The only people I would recommend that for are what they call people with sodium sensitive hypertension. For some reason. This, a lot of black people have this. It has to do with something called the, the renin angiotensin system. It's a genetic thing where they're born with a greater tendency to get, let's say, elevated blood pressure when they consume high sodium food. They have to be real careful because eventually that hypertension can either give them a stroke or destroy their kidneys completely. Uh, most people, their kidneys are gradually destroyed as they age because of subtle hypertension. In other words, if you go through life with elevated hypertension, your kidneys are slowly being destroyed. That's why I believe the figure is 50% of people over 60 only have 40% of their kidney function left. Mm -hmm. This is a gradual destruction of the filtering units. Uh, so, it, uh, uh, But for other people, and I did this huge article in my Applied Metabolics newsletter about so the truth about sodium, and what I discovered shocked me. I was shocked myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that you, know, you could actually get as much as six, if you're healthy, if you don't have a sodium... Six grams a day doesn't do anything bad to you. As six thousand milligrams, that's way more. Mm -hmm. And the, the funny thing is, here's the here's, here's the really ironic part thing about sodium. If you get too much, it's bad. In other words, if you get let's say twelve thousand milligrams a day, something like that. But if you get too little, it's just as bad. Mm. <clears throat> Both of them will kill you. So mm -hmm. you know, fifteen uh, fifteen hundred milligrams. It's it, it, it's not a, uh, a dangerous amount. But it's veering towards the the too low of sodium, uh, and bodybuilders and athletes could get a lot more sodium than they think. Although, if you're training for a contest, you know you want to get in that ripped shred shredded. Mm -hmm. I would still say to be careful about sodium intake because you can't get away from the fact that sodium does retain water. Mm -hmm. It does. So if you're concerned about that, of course, most a lot of the guys take diuretics which eliminates the problem completely. That's the easy way out. <laughs> if you take diuretics, you don't have to worry about it. So, mm -hmm. And another trick, by the way, uh, and, and this is if you don't want to take any drugs, is believe it or not, drinking a lot of water flushes the sodium out of the body. Water is a natural diuretic. People don't know this because it turns off a pituitary hormone called anti-diuretic hormone, which ca causes your body to retain water. The more water you drink, basically, the more water you excrete. See, I have a problem. I drink uh, like a protein drink. I tend after I and I work out at night, and after I don't drink much water when I'm working out. So when I come home, I take not only the protein drink, but I drink extra water. You mm -hmm. know, and, and I wind up having to go to the bathroom like ten times a night mm -hmm. because of that water. What's <laughs> happening is, you know, I'm t that again, I'm turning off the anti, and it's just going right through me. You know, any sodium, it's just passing right through me. Mm -hmm. So that's a little trick. I always tell that to women. Who have that bloating effect? You know, when they have their, uh, you know, their menstrual uh, cycle, mm -hmm. they get bloated. So increase the water intake. And you know, the funny thing is, the bodybuilders, a lot of them will, will tell you that they restrict water right. two days before. They restrict water. That's a stupid thing to do. Because yes. as soon as, as soon as you restrict water, the body, you know, the body's very sensitive to the volume of of of, uh, of water in the blood. The blood's mostly water. Mm -hmm. As soon as it goes down a little bit, which can happen by restricting mm -hmm. water. Your body goes into an emergency situation uh -huh. where it starts to retain water. So that's the worst thing you could do is to limit water intake 
before right, two days before you're gonna retain one. But Just most the, most bodybuilders have de de deplete themselves now. That's kind of like yeah. the yeah they deplete themselves. But you know they also have to remember that muscle tissue and everybody forgets this little figure. Mm -hmm. Muscle tissue is seventy two percent water. Mm -hmm. So if you if you lose too much water, guess where it's gonna come from? It's not gonna come from fat. It's gonna come from muscle. So you know you know you see ever see these guys lad. You see him about four days, maybe a week before the contest, and they're shredded. Mm -hmm. and you look at, say, well, this guy's going to win. This guy's mm -hmm. going to be. And then you, you, sure. know, you see him in the end of the contest, and they don't look quite as cut. They're, they're you know, the, the vascularity is not there. I'm not saying they're fat, mm -hmm. but the, they don't look ripped anymore. I, I've seen this over and over, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it has to do with the, with the way they adjusted their, their water intake. Or they might have taken too many diuretics. And if you take too many diuretics, you get an overkill effect where the muscles actually flatten out again, because remember the glycogen, which another thing that gives you muscle fullness, mm -hmm. each gram of glycogen in the muscle stored with 2.7 grams of water. You take too many diuretics, you pull the, the water out of the glycogen and you pull the water out of the tissues. So you get too flat a look. It's a fine line. In other words, you want to be really dehydrated on the kind of, you do have to be a little dehydrated, but you know, if you go too far, it starts to reverse. And again, you're not going to look fat, but you're going to look flat. That's the term they use, and it's true. Mm -hmm. I've seen it a million times. Interesting. Million. Yeah. Interesting. So I want to ask you a few questions about competitive bodybuilding. You know, first of all, um, how do you feel like the bodybuilding industry, the, the competitive bodybuilding, has been advancing in the last, let's say, three years? Well, there's been interesting some some interesting developments, as you know. Uh, you might know, you might remember. I, I worked with Joe Weider for many years. I was mm -hmm. a science editor for uh, Muscle uh, Muscle and Fitness for a decade, and I wrote for Flex and this and that. Uh, I, I kind of uh, I kind of look at those days as the golden era, you know, the uh, let's say from the 70s to the 90s, mm -hmm. and after that it, it kind of changed, particularly when uh, and again I don't want to cast and cast cast any uh, cast any aspersion, but you know it, it changed when the big corporate thing like AMI when they took over the Weider Empire, mm -hmm. it came it wasn't the same after that, and, and uh, now you have a guy named Jake Wood who I. I, I Apparently, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I might have met him somewhere along the line. I don't remember if I did, honestly. But apparently, he bought the whole thing. I mean, uh, he bought the uh, Weeda magazines. Mm -hmm. He bought uh, – uh, and, and one thing that's interesting, very interesting to me, is this guy is a big fan of female bodybuilding. And he's actually bringing you back to Miss Olympia. I was, like, stunned when I heard that because the, in 2014, they cut out the female Olympia, which they said there was just no interest in it. Nobody liked the look of the female bodybuilders. They've gotten away from it, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as the direction it goes, uh, I know that Sean Roden is a controversial bodybuilder for many reasons. But I know the guy. He's a friend of mine. I like him personally. I think he's a really nice guy. But the thing is, I th thought that him winning the Olympia was a turn in the right direction. Because this guy, to me, had, was like a hybrid. He had the symmetry and balance of the guys back in the 70s, 80s, but he didn't have that bloated, big look, and his muscles didn't look out of proportion where, like, I don't want to mention names, but like where the che where the arms and shoulders completely overshadowed the torso, he, he looked in balance. And I said, okay, if this is what they're looking for, I like this. I like this trend, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, now, you got this current guy, uh, 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 Brandon. Brandon's, I know, I met him a couple of, he said, also a terrific person. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a great physique. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say he has a bad look, but uh, you know the thing is with the Mr. Olympia, there's no getting away from it. You got to have a freaky look, or you're not going to win. So you know uh, what I like to, to make the thought complete. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of adding these other divisions like men's physique. Uh, what's the other one called? Uh, classic men's, classic physique. Yeah, I'm sorry, classic physique and men's physique. This is a good idea because, and you know, the thing is, I'm going to be blunt about it. These divisions were not added to help people. These were added to make more money for the promoters. Let's put the cards on the table. I mean, and, and, and they say, well, we wanted it so the guys don't, you know, they, 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 we, we didn't want the guys to think they have to take a lot of drugs and get big. We sure. wanted to let them know they can get a, uh, build a physique that's within normal limits. They don't have to hurt. Ah, bullshit. The truth is, those things were added because they make more money. All these guys pay entry fees and stuff. But besides that, mm -hmm. you, you still have to say, that it is a good idea because, again, these physiques uh, harken back 
to the uh, to the physiques of years ago, mm -hmm. which are much more popular with the public. I mean, you know, you uh, look at the, some of the uh, 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 what is it? Um, not the the men's physique. Those are the guys that wear the board shorts, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. they have very attainable physiques. They're muscular, but you could see these kind of guys on the beach. There's a lot of guys that maybe not even bodybuilders, but they're pretty muscular. But those guys are getting progressively actually more and more muscular. Have you, have you been uh, noticing that in the last like three yes. years? They've been progressively. Yeah. Not only that, but even the women are getting more muscular. I mean, the ones like, like uh, for example, fitness and even the bikini, I mean, they're starting to get a harder look with each year. This is some sort of trend that kind of sneaks in after a while. In other words, the way the human mind, it reminds me of a statement where they asked uh, a mountain climber years ago, why do you climb these, uh, why did you climb Mount Everest? And his, say, and his answer was, because it's there. In other words, you could apply that to bodybuilding where, you know, words, the way the human mind works, people always want to achieve another goal. Sure. They want to get better and better. <clears throat> so that, I'm sorry, the natural evolution is to get more cut a little bit bigger. And it kind of creeps up year by year where maybe three years from now, mm -hmm. <laughs> the men's physique and the, uh, and the and the uh, and the classic bodybuilding will look almost like the Olympia guys did back in let's say '80. They're going to be a much bigger, you know. Now theoretically, you could say as somebody who's a uh, let's say a devil's advocate would say, no, Jerry, it's right there in the rules. In other words, if they get too big, points are taken off. So the guys that get carried away and try and get 22 inch arms or whatever, they're not they're going to place last mm -hmm. because it's right there in the rules. You literally mm -hmm. can't get too big. But you can still get harder, see? In other words, these guys, it's like Frank Zane, you know, the three-time Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. Frank Zane told me years ago, he realized with his bone strength, he had six and a half inch wrists. Mm -hmm. He made an assessment of himself. He realized he can never be as big as a guy like Arnold and the other guys. So he said to, he said to himself, I'm going to get as hard and as finished as possible. And I'm going to go on the stage with this ripped, shredded, uh, you know, complete physique. And I'm going to compete against those guys with this physique. And he was successful. So that's what these guys are going to try and do since they have a limitation on how exactly how big they can get. And they will get bigger, but not that much bigger. Mm -hmm. They can try and get harder and harder. You know, they're, they're trying to get all the detail out in you know, the upper back. I look at the guys, for example, that won the, uh, the class, uh, this, um, uh, well, not the guy who won this year, the guy, uh, I can't remember his name, the guy who won the year before. Brandon, think, Brandon Hendrickson. Yes, yeah, you know, I mean, he has tremendous back detail, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. the same with the, uh, with the uh, you know, the, the, the uh, men's physique, in other words, they want deep ramps, more serratus and stuff, and ripped up deltoids. Uh, I, and I think I might have mentioned to you years ago, I have a little beef with the men's physique in that I don't like the board short stuff. Because it hides, you know, the thighs are the largest muscle on the body. Right. And to me, to hide the thighs is ludicrous for a bodybuilding show. Those are the biggest muscles in the body. However, I think the philosophy behind that is to saying, hey, buddy, uh, you in the audience, you want to compete? Yeah, come on up on stage with your shorts on. In other words, they're saying it's so kind of informal that, that right. they want to... They want to get as far away from, the, you know, the, cla the classic hardcore bodybuilding as possible. You know, the guys with the jock strap brief. So they have to wear these big, big shorts. That's the message they're trying to say. Well, you know, some of them actually, they, they work legs a lot. And, and they actually, oh, they, they, have, they have very muscular legs. It's just that, obviously, it's, that's part of the, you know, part of the presentation. And they have to, they have to do that. I totally agree with you. And that's what, it must be frustrating for them. I mean, here these guys are working their legs just as hard as anyone else. And sure. they can't even show them. <laughs> <laughs> they might have ripped glutes or whatever they can't show them but that's but, the way it's set up but you know, you know also i feel like i feel like in, in every division everybody sort of like the whole division gets a little bit bigger and more muscular i think it's because let's say you win this year then the next year you have to kind of come back and improve something has to get improved right you can't come back with the same exact look i guess you can but you know that, that's what they all say you know i have to come back a little bit better a little bit better and i guess that that, in a sense, means that they have to be more muscular. So every division will see that progression forward. More muscular, more bigger, more strong, you know? That's true. That's a natural course of events. And in fact, yeah. I remember Arnold telling me years ago, Arnold, uh, his philosophy was that once you reach his level of development, you know, like where basically he's near maximum, uh, he says you can't change, your, you know, he, he agreed with you. He said to win the contest each year, you have to show improvement. Mm -hmm. He says you can't, a guy like me, I can't change my whole body in one year. I've already like reached the limit. So what he would do is he'd actually pick one body part that was maybe a little bit behind, like let's say forearms or something like that. 
and he'd focus on that. Arnold said that it's funny that you wouldn't think so, but the judges somehow can actually notice that. You wouldn't think they'd notice it, but they notice it, and they suddenly say, oh, look, Arnold's made improvements. He's better than he was last year, so he wins again. This is what Arnold's belief was, and you can't argue the fact that he did win. He won over year after year. Must have right, right, exactly. Um, do you think Phil Heath should come back to Olympia stage and compete again, or do you feel like he won seven, you know, and, and obviously that was the judges made a, made a different call that final year when he competed, and that should be indication for him to not come back on Olympia stage. How do you feel? Like, you know, obviously it's an opinion. So in your opinion, how do you feel? I'd love to see him come back. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Phil Heath was a absolutely incredible bodybuilder. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like in boxing. You know, a lot of times these guys, undefeated fighters, they'll get knocked out. And when they come back, they never, they're never the same. It's almost like something, it's not that their body changes or their boxing ability. Something happens in their brain where they kind of like don't think they're as good as they were before. And it shows in the, in the, in the boxing. I'm wondering if Phil Heath, and I don't know the man personally, I couldn't say this, maybe he's saying to himself, well, if I come back, you know, maybe I won't be, a, 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 you know, a, as good as I was before or a, a, have the ability to, you know, to win again. Or he might be thinking maybe there's some sort of political thing where they just don't want me to have the over. And I, I think that's what he kind of hinted at in, in a couple of interviews where they just didn't want him to be the, you know, the greatest Olympia champion. Uh, if he had, uh, well, actually, if he had won the last one, I think he would have tied. He would have tied him. with Lee Haney and, and Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. Right, but see, if he had won that one, that means automatically, because he, I've heard him say in interviews, his goal was to win 10, I think he said. So if he had won that last one, you know for sure he would have went back and won the ninth one, you know, or oh, tried to win the ninth one. Sure. So that was kind of derailed, and I think it kind of kind of caught him off guard uh, in a way. Uh, and uh, And another thing that we don't know about, is Phil Heath's health problems. I mean, how is his health? Maybe he has something going on where it might be risky for him to, to go through the procedure that you need to go through to compete in the Olympia. I mean, we know he had a couple of hernia operations. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, uh, I, I assume that they were all successful and there's no problem. But uh, I think the only thing holding, let, let me put a flat statement. To me, the only thing holding back Phil Heath is his head. In other words, if he wants to come back, if he feels... Uh, uh, you know, motivated to, to, to prove he's the best, he'll come back. If he doesn't care, if he's making a lot of money where he doesn't feel it's necessary, uh, that then, you know, that's good too. It, it's up to him. But personally, I'd love to see him come back. I, I think it would be very interesting. <clears throat> what is your top five of all time? Well, you got to give me five top bodybuilders, open, open men's bodybuilders of all time. you got to give me five, Jerry. Okay, oh, it's a, that's a little bit of a tough one. Uh, I'm going to say... Uh, Right off the bat, I have to say, I have to pick Arnold as the first guy. Uh, uh, but before you answer, it has to be obviously based on physiques. We're talking about physiques only. We're not talking about what they achieved in bodybuilding as far as success. You know, just just physiques. I, I still would pick Arnold. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Arnold, and second would definitely be Ronnie Coleman. Uh, and if they had a most muscular award, it would be Ronnie Coleman. And nobody's ever built as much muscle as him. Uh, regardless of what his body, body fat was, there's no doubt about <laughs> muscle he had. Uh, third, uh, my, I, my opinion would be Sergio Oliva. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an interesting choice because I know Sergio Jr. is a friend of mine. I didn't like Sergio personally. I've had a couple of run-ins his father. He was very, very arrogant, nasty to me. But, you know, I have to be objective about it and Absolutely. separate my personal feelings and say he's third. Uh, fourth. Now that now that I'd really have to think about that one. You got you caught me off guard because <laughs> uh, those would definitely be the top three, four. Let's see. For who would that be? Uh, hmm. I know this is gonna. People will argue with this choice, but I'm gonna say Frank Zane. No, it's a good choice. Frank is a good yeah, choice. Yeah, he was finished, complete, and always ripped in shape, and, uh, tremendous uh, physique. And and, uh, and the fifth one would be. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Hold on a second. Oh, uh, let me see. Oh, Phil Heath. Phil Heath. Yeah. Phil Heath, for that, that would be my fifth choice. I think yeah. Phil definitely deserves to be in tougher. And you know, it's funny because Phil got a lot of hate from, from the industry. I feel like different people always talk about him. But I've been interviewing a lot of people recently, and they all put Phil in the top five. I'm, I'm actually pleased to hear that. You have to. I mean, if, if you're objective, you have to. The man was an incredible physique, you know. Phil, my personal opinion, I mean, I met, I met him one time. He, he seemed like a really nice guy to me. Uh, it's a funny story. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, but... 
one of the years he won the Olympia, he was, uh, uh, he was I don't know whether he was married to or engaged to a woman. And uh, after he won, he grabbed the microphone. Apparently his, well, let's say it's his fiance. She was battling breast cancer at the time. And in, in the microphone, he started to say how his, his uh, fiance gave him the inspiration and the courage to train hard and win this Olympia. And he brought her on stage. And as he's talking in the microphone, he starts to tear up, you know, and, uh, and you know, and I'm looking, I'm thinking, wow, this guy is a really sensitive guy. You know, kudos to him, you know. But the next day I go on the Internet and people say, look at that pussy. Oh, look at him. He's crying. Oh, cry, baby. Oh, oh, oh. he's a cry, baby. Give him a diaper. And they're calling him all these names. That's I'm thinking, crazy. What's wrong with these people? Oh, so man. I see t about three days later. You know, they, they were in Gold's Gym. They have these big pictures of the Mr. Olympia winners. Mm -hmm. They were going to put up Flex Magazine was going to have a part, gave a party for Phil Heath to be, to, to uh, celebrate his picture being put up in mm -hmm. Gold's Gym. So I had never met the man, and I walked up to him and I said, uh, "Phil, uh, my name's Jerry Brady." He goes, "Oh, Jerry, I've been reading uh, your magazines, uh, your articles for years." And I'm thinking, <laughs> he rem "I haven't really written for the, a lot of the magazines for years." He still remember. I, I, I was a little shocked about that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I said to him, "Listen, Phil, I know you're getting, you're probably getting some flack about, you know, your emotional display there at the Olympia. I just want to tell you, I still remember what I said to him. Mm -hmm. I said, let me tell you something, my friend. It takes a real man to show his feelings." I said. Just ignore what these idiots are saying. They're morons. It takes a real man. I was very impressed by that, that you love your fiance and this and that. That's what a, a, an intelligent person looks at. It. Forget the trolls, I said. He says, I really appreciate it. He shakes my hand. You know, here's the funny part of the story. Two weeks later, I walked away. Two weeks later, I see him. He's in the gym. There's no party or anything. He's just working out. And I go, and he's, and he's walking to us. I says, hey, Phil, how you doing? He goes, do, no, no expression on his face. Do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, this is true story. Now, here's the thing. I didn't, I just laughed. I, I didn't. I said, never mind. It's okay. I said, you look great, my friend. And I walked away. And I said, that was the whole conversation. But the point is, I tell you that anecdote because it, it gives you an idea of why Phil generated such dislike. He came off to a lot of people as arrogant. You know what I mean? Uh, and the problem is. You can be arrogant as long as you add an element of humbleness, too. Uh, like, for example, uh, Muhammad Ali was seemingly very arrogant, uh, you know. And, but the thing is, he would tell these poems, <clears throat> he'd make these little jokes, which would soften the arrogance. See, Phil didn't, he didn't learn to do that. A lot of times he just came off as really arrogant. And, and, and you know, that turned off a lot of people. I don't think he was a bad guy, honestly. I don't think he really meant to be like that, but I'm trying to explain why a lot of people attacked him because he came off as a little bit too arrogant. He should have added a little bit of humbleness, you know, like, for example, he might say something like, they say, well, Phil, are you going to win this uh, ninth Mr. Olympia? Let's say he won the eighth one. He, he could say something like, uh, well, he says, uh, I'm going to short, short train hard for it. You know, the, the guys are really looking great. It's getting harder and harder every year because they're catching up to me. You know, it's going to take a lot of work. That's the proper answer. But the way Phil would, a would answer is, hell yeah, I'm going to win it. These guys can't touch me. That turns people off. See, that's what I mean by adding an element of humble. You can say you're going to win without coming off as arrogant. That's my opinion. I mean, I, I personally feel like if, if you're doing an interview, it builds excitement for the for the upcoming you know fight or upcoming battle and yeah. bodybuilding. I, I don't mind that at all. But you know, besides all that, I'm, I'm saying I feel like it's good that people acknowledge his physique. You know what I mean? Like, you know, be, being one of the supreme physiques of the of the, of, of of all time, really. Oh, you have to. I mean, you, uh, if you have to be objective about whether you like the man or not. It's mm -hmm. like me with Sergio Oliva. I don't even like him personally. But you see, I, p I placed him third on the all-time sure. great list. And, I, sure. and I've told his son. I said, I told him the stories, well, what his father said to me, you know. And uh, he laughed. He says, well, he, he could be really moody. He said, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, there's a kind of what, a, what did he tell you? What, what happened between you and Sergio exactly? Well, but when I was uh, first thing happened when I was uh, when he first showed up. This is years ago mm -hmm. when he first came over to the, to the IFBB. Uh, I was there in Brooklyn at Brooklyn Academy of Music. I got backstage and he was like the big sensation at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, this new guy. I mean, still had hair on his head and all this. And I, I went backstage to get his autograph. I was 14 years old, <clears throat> and, I, and I remember he was wearing a butcher's robe. It had blood all over it. You know, <laughs> and so I went up to him. I said, 
Mr. Lever, can I have, you know, in the meantime, I'd gotten the autograph of all the top bodybuilders that year, all the guys who wanted the show. So I went up, he was the last guy. I wanted to, I said, Mr. Lever, can I get your autograph? Now, I don't know if I could curse it. Can you want me to give you yeah, a verbatim? Yeah, go ahead. Give, give, give it verbatim. He said to me, get the f*** out of my face. That's his exact <laughs> words. And, and, and I was from Brooklyn, you know, I was kind of a little tough guy. And I looked at him and I said to myself, what should I do? My first impulse is to jump on him and punch him in the face. But then I looked at him, I noticed he had scars and he had this kind of face that looks like he, he would kill you in two seconds. And I just didn't say anything. And I used my hand and I walked away. Here's the funny part of the story. Over many, maybe 35 years later, I don't know if you remember, they had the gathering. Joe brought all the past Mr. Olympias on stage uh, for a celebration. I think it was the 35th or 30th anniversary of the Mr. Olympia. And Sergio was there. And, you know, uh, I, 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 that year I, I came up with the idea of interviewing all the past Mr. Olympia winners for an article, just asking brief questions, mm -hmm. you know, not extended interview. I had, and all of them cooperated. And so the last guy, again, was Sergio Oliva. So I see him, he's sitting at a booth, he's selling a statue in the famous pose like that with his arms up. And I went up to him, I said, Sergio, uh, I, I didn't think he'd remember me. And I know he didn't. I said, Sergio, uh, my, my name's Jerry Brain. I'm a, I worked for Joe Weider. I, I wanted to ask you a couple of brief questions. Uh, I've already uh, I've spoken to all the other Olympia winners. So he goes, uh, he says, uh, you say, who, who, who are you from? I said, uh, well, I, I write for Joe's magazines. He goes, Joe Weider? I said, yeah. He says, $15,000. He goes like that. I said, what? He says, if you want to interview me, you got to pay 15000 I said, well, it's only a brief. It's only like one or two questions. That's it. He says, I don't care. If it's Joe Weider, I want 15000 Mm. I said, well, listen, Sergio, you know Joe. Do you think Joe's going to pay you $15,000 for an interview? He says, he goes like this. He says, really? He says, get the f*** out of my face. <laughs> oh. This is 30 years later. And I, and, I tell that, and I told the story to Sergio Jr. So we had a little joke going because he was training at Gold's Gym at the time. Mm. Every time I came in the gym, he was at the other end of the gym. He'd yell out, hey, Jerry. I said, what's that, Sergio? He said, get the f*** out of my face. He yelled across the gym. It was kind of funny for a while. He still wow. does that when I see him, just as a joke. You know? That's funny. Wow. Yeah, you know? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I, uh, people tell me that I must have gotten surgery at an off time because he's a nice guy. Well, they probably had a fallout. He probably had a fallout with, with Joe Weider or so, over oh, something. He didn't, he didn't like Joe Weider. In other words, if I would have not said to Joe Weider, he probably would have answered my question. I, I, didn't, I made the mistake of mentioning that I was working for Joe, and that that turned him off completely. I understand. I don't. I don't. You know, I don't even take it personal. I mean, I know he has sure. a beef. It gets. I, I totally understand. I didn't get mad about that. But sure. again, from my perspective, I wouldn't call him a friendly guy. <laughs> I don't know. How, you know. I hear you. So I feel like this year at Olympia, they, they say it's going to be in December this year, right? Um, yeah. I think the most exciting part about this Olympia is Flex Lewis. Going to a men's open, he, he was a champion for many years in 212 division. He was considered to be the, the best of all time in 212. Now he's going to uh, to men's open. Now, do you think he's going to win? What do you think his chances are? How do you think he's going to do? Well, every time I've seen a uh, Flex Lewis win, my my first thought has always been this guy is actually good enough to compete in the Open Olympia. He's got mm -hmm. everything. Got those huge calves. He's got the back detail. He's got everything. And then. Like, what was it, one of his last years, he said something about retiring. He was going to spend time with his kid and, uh, you know, and this and that. And I said to myself, gee, that's kind of sad. I would have loved to uh, see him compete in the open because, I mean, he's got everything. Like I say, you know, if you judge a head-to-toe body, I, you know, he's got to do well. The only thing he has, the only problem with him is he's got, he's got the, uh, he's got the help, uh, he's got that what we call the height problem. In other words, uh, you, you know, said the over, height, the height problems in the height problem. Is he's not as tall as the other guy. It's not that the other guys are giants, you know, but but what is he? Something like five, six, five, seven. I don't know what he is. Something I'm not like sure. That. But yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, you can see he's a little shorter than the other guys. Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of great bodybuilders in the past that I felt should have won the title. You know, I think this directly applies to Flex Lewis. These men, I believe, because I was at these contests, uh, for example, in 1990, I had. Uh, 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 what the, oh, gee, I just I forgot his name for a second. I had it right in front of me. Oh, uh, um, God, Lee Labrada. Mm -hmm. Lee Labrada. Uh, now, sir, uh, he was going against Lee Haney, who was a fantastic bodybuilder, you know. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, that was the year 
they tested for steroids, and a lot of the guys looked off that year. They really did. And the thing is, Lee Haney looked great, but he wasn't at his best, whereas Lee Labrada was shredded, ripped, finished, head-to-toe body, had everything. <clears throat> I remember after the pre-judging, tell, telling a friend of mine, Lee Labrada's going to win. And, and sure enough, one of the judges confided to me. This was after the pre-judging. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> said, guess what, Jerry? I said, well, he said, Lee LeBron is actually ahead of Lee, of Lee Haney. I said, seriously? Because I picked Lee LeBron. I said, wow. wow. I said, the judging is right on. I'm glad to see that. Comes the night show, and Lee Haney wins again. Remember, he had already won a couple of Olympias. Right. So, you know, so I, I asked one of the uh, officials. I don't want to mention his name because he's still around. But I, I asked one of his officials, one of the officials, I said, how could, how could, how could Lee Labrada lose the contest when he was won the prejudging? <clears throat> how? How is that possible? Mm -hmm. The only guy told me. He says uh, Lee won because of his presentation. I said, excuse me, presentation. He says, well, the way he posed. If you ever see Lee, go on YouTube. <clears throat> I'm sorry, go on YouTube. Look at a, 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 a video of Lee Labrada posing. The guy was superb. He was a master poser. He looked like he was doing a ballet dance, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in all due respect to Lee Haney, Lee would pose like this, Lee Haney. You, you know, nothing. No flow, nothing. So, and they're telling me that Lee Haney was a better poser. I personally believe that Lee won that year, Lee Haney, because he had he was the success of Mr. Olympia. He had the impetus going for him because he had won several years. And also because Lee Labrada was a smaller bodybuilder. I've, I had Sean Ray winning the Olympia maybe once or twice. I've told this to Sean Ray. I'm, it's not that I'm trying to kiss his ass, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I don't dislike Sean, but I, I told him the truth. I said, being objective, I felt that you had the most complete physique. But in other words, I've seen this over and over again, you know, where the shorter guy, even if he has the most complete physique, has everything together, muscle definition, <clears throat> sure. st still loses to the big guy. And in fact, one year, many years ago, I, they had one of those Mr. Olympia press conferences I brought it up. I was in the audience. I asked the question. I think it was, uh, I think it was actually Sean Ray who answered. I said, Sean, don't you think that there should be divisions? I mean, I mean, look at Franco Colombo and Arnold. I can go on and on. The short guy never wins. Never, no matter how good he is, never seems to beat the bigger guy, the taller guy. Don't you think it'd be nicer if they had another division, maybe lighter body weight? And uh, Sean answered, which shocked me. I was really. He says, no. He says. There should only be one Mr. Olympia. He says, having more than one division takes away the prestige of the title. That's mm. the way. He couldn't foresee that eventually there'd be a 212 division. Of course. Well, 212 was that. That became for actually for, for the shorter guys, right? The ones that exactly. were. That's, that's yeah. why it was created, basically. That's exactly why it was created. For the exact reason I said. Because it was very apparent that the shorter guys, no matter how good they are, we're, we're never going to beat the big guys. It's not going to, you know, when I say big, again, just slightly taller, but sure. let's say if your body weight, whatever. So this is to answer your question, a long-winded way of answering it. Mm -hmm. I, this is what I worry about with Flex, uh, you know, with Flex Lewis. He, to me, he's a winning physique. In other words, uh, uh, I could see him winning. Let me put it that way, flat statement. Right. But will he win? I mean, Brandon is not that much taller than him. I was going to say that I have, to, I have to look at the comparison between the two because I feel like Flex is actually not that short. And I feel like, yeah. you know, Brandon is great too, but I just feel like he he'll definitely has a good chance to at least I, be in the top two. Let me put it this way. If I, if Flex, we, um, I keep calling it Flex, Flex Lewis, if Flex Lewis, if Flex Wheel is another great one. Right. You know what? I, I, I mean, if you ask me the greatest body blues, you ask me, uh, I, I really should have, if you had, uh, I, I should have put Flex Wheel. That's the name I forgot because, to me, he's one of the right there in the top five. I'd I, I'd have to put him in there too. Who do you want to swap? Yes. Who, do, who would you swap swap out for him? Uh, I'm going to swap out. For, uh, do all due respect to Frank. He's a friend of. I'd have to take Frank <laughs> Saint out and put in Flex Wheeler. You know, even though Frank won the Olympia three times and Flex never, because Flex his physique was so. I can't even. I don't have words to even say it. Mm -hmm. It was so incredibly superb. The man had everything. I mean, you know, I have to put Flex in there. Mm -hmm. But as far as Flex Lewis goes, I, let me give you this statement. If Flex Lewis shows up in the best shape ever, he could win. I'm saying that. I think he, in a fair show, he, and again, all due respect to Brandon Curry, sure. who's, I agree with you, a great, great body, but a great person too. Uh, and I don't know Flex Lewis. I assume he is too. But the thing is, if he shows up, in my opinion, 
shredded head to toe with those big calves he has and everything else, he can win. There's no question in my mind. Mm -hmm. He can win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Jerry, you mentioned um, you mentioned the year where they tested for steroids, right? Where Lee Haney competed. Um, uh, when we did an interview three years ago, you told me that um, you think steroids should be legalized for sports. It should be like it should be just legalized in all sports, including bodybuilding, right? Do you still feel the same way today, three years later? And how do you feel about natural bodybuilding organizations that also exist out there? We're actually making a film about natural bodybuilding right now, so there's quite a few of them out there. Um, but but do you still have the same opinion as you did three years ago about natural? I mean, about testing and bodybuilding. I do, and I'll tell you why. It's strictly for health reasons, because the thing is, the guys are going to take the drugs anyway. You can have drug tests, and you, get, you know, it's always been a cat and mouse game, like I said years ago, mm -hmm. between the testing uh, organizations like WADA and the athletes. In other words, because there's so much at stake in professional athletes, you have millions of dollars that where they can make, and in bodybuilding, you have the you know the the echelon, the upper limits of of bodybuilding competition like Mr. Olympia. I mean, no matter how many drug tests they put, and of course we know that the Mr. Olympia isn't even drug tested for crying out loud. Right. But I mean, the thing is that besides that, uh, these guys, my point is these guys are gonna always take drugs. They're always gonna find a way if they, uh, uh, you know, they get, you know these, the, the steroid chemists that can come up with, a, with the so-called designer steroids, which already exist. You know, there's always, they, they can always design new steroids. They're always gonna beat the drug tests so, you know, the guys have to be monitored. In other words, if you make uh, steroids legal, you have to have a proviso where the guys have to undergo regular medical testing. In other words, you have to see a doctor, they have to have the lab test. To, in other words, if they're heading for a brick wall where something looks like it's going to go in their body, and I'm talking pretty thorough testing. I'm talking about, for example, cardiac scans where they check, let's say, the level of calcium in their coronary arteries because I, I wrote about a study uh, done a couple of years ago, where they did they uh, they examined 14 elite professional bodybuilders. These were Mr. Olympia competitors. Now this was a medical journal, so they don't list the names, but I know who they were. I, Ronnie Coleman was in there. There was all the guys in that era, you know. And uh, 12 of them, none of these guys had any cardiac symptoms, but 12 of them showed calcium deposits in the in the coronary. The calcium deposits are a, a forerunner of eventual severe heart disease, possibly even congestive heart failure or atherosclerosis. In other words, if these guys kept it up, they eventually would get a heart attack or stroke. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that kind of thing should be monitored. And it, it's, to me, it, it should be treated like boxing. If a guy gets knocked out, when you get knocked out in a fight, you have a concussion automatically. There's some brain damage. In other words, uh, if, you know, if you get, let's say, knocked out twice, you go through two bouts, and you get knocked out twice. There's a mandatory time where you can't box again. You have to. You know, they make you heal because they know in the third time you might die. You might die in the ring, and some guys die anyway, even with just one knockout. Mm -hmm. It's rare, but it happens. The same with the bodybuilders. In other words, uh, if they show really bad lab tests, then they're going to have to, be, you know, get off the steroids. You know, they have to be monitored. But my point is that right now, the biggest problem is as far as the legalization goes, is that a lot of them are getting it, their drugs from the black market. And that bothers me because, I've again, I've written about guys, not necessarily elite bodybuilders. There was one guy in Australia who bought some black market uh, steroids. I think it was Trenbolone, if I remember correctly. It turned out it was loaded with arsenic. I don't know mm. why they put arsenic in a Trenbolone uh, preparation. It killed him. He had no health problems. He was, 20, he was 32 years old and he died. <clears throat> So this, this more than anything else, I think steroids should be legalized because otherwise they're going to go through unethical sources uh, and possibly that, that's going to really hurt them. You know, you could die uh, taking these but I, I was talking to a doctor um, the other day and he told me that the, the quality of steroids went down in the last 10, 20 years, like 10, 15 years. And that's because the, back then they were actually like high high-end, you know, pharmaceutical-grade steroids. Right. Because uh, because people started using them for bodybuilding purposes or, or for, for sports, they, they, they shut down a lot of the productions. And now a lot of the stuff is underground labs basically manufacturing it. That's exactly true. That's the problem. Years ago, for example, uh, well, I guess it's no secret I could say it now, Arnold Schwarzenegger actually got his uh, steroids, believe it or not, directly 
from a guy who worked for the Shearing Drug Company in Germany. I mean, his stuff was directly from the drug company. It was as pure as you can get, right? Germany is a stickler for purity in drugs, by the way, much more so than the FDA here. Wow. So, you know, those were the days. I mean, like, it's what you say is true. Years ago, any steroids you get usually were, were fine. There, there was no adulter, adulterants added or contamination. But now, again, because of the restrictions, severe restrictions, I mean, doctors to prescribe an anabolic steroid, it's like a tri what they call a triplicate prescription. And one of those uh, prescriptions goes directly to the uh, FDA, I believe it is. Uh, I'm sorry, not the FDA, the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And if a doctor, for example, a legitimate MD, writes out too many prescriptions, let's say for a bodybuilder, mm -hmm. he can get his license uh, taken away. And his, sure, you know, of course. He's out of business. Because of, no of the dosages, that it's completely exactly. different. Right, yeah, right. Of course. And no doctor who's goes, if you know anything about how, what it takes to become a doctor, nobody's going to risk that to help right. a bodybuilder. You know, they're not going to do it. So the thing is, that leaves the only option to go underground and get these crappy steroids. And I'm going to tell you right now, Vlad, a lot of people don't know this. This is kind of like going to freak some people out. But mm -hmm. the quality, I, you know, uh, every so often the medical journals, especially the drug analysis journals, they will take. They will work with the uh, cops who, let's say, raided a drug uh, a place that sells, you know, dealers that sell the steroids and the other drug. And and what they do, what these scientists do, is they analyze these black market drugs directly and they write it up. And I've seen them. And I'm telling you, in the last couple of years, they found lower. Just like just to confirm what you're saying, mm -hmm. they found lower and lower quality. A lot of them were just. If you're lucky, you get one that has nothing in it. Basically, saline solution or oil doesn't Plus, have any a placebo <laughs> for steroids. If you're lucky, because it's not going to hurt you, it's just not going to do anything. But in, in a worst case scenario, you have heavy metals in there, That's crazy. which can screw up your brain. Like you say, this one guy had arsenic. I mean, what is yeah, arsenic? Insane. Do? That's crazy. And steroids uh, injection, you know. And then you got, I mean, then you got something like Trenbolone. Which I mean, that was removed. That's never really been sold to human. Only one form of it was. It's always been a veterinary steroid, like Finnegan for years, all this kind of stuff. I mean, that thing. Uh, I'm telling you, more than any other steroid, every, the medical journal, they're always reporting case studies mm -hmm. about always bodybuilders who got screwed up. You mm -hmm. know, either heart problems or liver problems or something from taking the underground black market Trembolone. And the significance of this is that Trembolone. I can tell you it's one of the most popular steroids. It's got this reputation for making you big and hard at the same time. It's a very popular underground steroid, and I'm telling you, it's crap. I don't care what any of these guys on YouTube say. I'm not saying every trend balloon that that's sold in the black market is fake. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that at all. All I'm saying is that when you buy it, you're taking a huge risk. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is if you legalize steroids, it would probably cut down. Just like, for example, when they legalize marijuana, you know, this, the, the dealers of marijuana, they took a big hit because mm -hmm. now people didn't have to buy, you know. There's quality marijuana. control now, yeah, there's a whole different, of course. Yeah, you yeah. Go quality control, they make sure it doesn't have any adulterants and this and that, it's safer. And that's, again, that more sure. than any other reason is why I still believe steroids should be legalized. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you, actually. So we are making a movie right now about natural bodybuilding, right? Sure. And basically, everybody's given a urine test. They will take urine tests before the competition, sometimes after, sometimes like in the middle somewhere. But um, I keep getting, I keep seeing people emailing me all the time. They're saying, well, you know, if you, let's say, take steroids and then you stop the last week before the competition, you take a urine test, it's not going to show up. Is that true or not true? For certain steroids, it's true. Yeah, but not, not for all steroids, though. Not Only all for steroids. Some. For example, uh, some steroids, uh, just to give you, again, off the top of my head, let's say some uh, one of these natural guys is taking Decaduralbin and doesn't know the pharmacokinetics of the drug. Well, it turns out that Deca <laughs> Decaduralbin is probably the worst steroid you can take if you're in a drug test in competition mm -hmm. because it leaves behind, let's say, markers or residues, whatever, whatever you want to call it, that can last, get this 24 months, two wow. years they can detect wow. it, two years. Now, some of the ones uh, that uh, give you uh, on the other uh, end of the scale, let's say something like testosterone propionate, which is a very quick acting testosterone, in and out in a day, right? If you get off that fast enough, you can beat the drug tests, you know. But, but if you take get if you get carried away and you take too much, now you're going to change what they call the testosterone epi ratio. 
that's the official test for testosterone. And if it's a below, if, if the it's levels below, are going to be much higher, right? The levels, yeah, exactly, you know, yeah. exactly. If it's below uh, above ratio of four to one, you know, then you're positive for drug testing. It used to be six to one. Then they changed it to four to one. And you know what the ironic part is? And this is kind of sad. There's a lot of people that have that ratio and aren't taking anything. That's just the way their body produces Natural. it. Mm. Yeah. I, I, for example, let's say a woman, a female bodybuilder. Uh, let's say she drinks a lot of alcohol for some reason uh, a day or two before the show, and you know, and, and she's got you know that could actually elevate her natural testosterone to the point where she can fail a drug test. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. It's just a quirk of female metabolism. So, so to put it simply, it's it's not easy to beat a to beat a, a steroid test, a drug test. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing. You got to really no, know what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. It, it can be done though. It can be done. Uh, uh, for example, years ago, uh, the, a lot of the guys or, or athletes, not just bodybuilders, they take a drug called probenicid. Now, pro, probenicid would actually cause your uh, body to, uh, uh, you know, it would change the ratio of, of the epi to testosterone. Mm -hmm. So it would make you look like you were clean. Mm -hmm. Other guys would, uh, you know, uh, they would use other people's urine or something. I don't know how right, they did right, that. Right. They'd put a thing under their shirt or something like right, that. Right, you know? right. That's a, those are those are the way some guys believe that if you drank a lot of water, you know, you could flush out the steroids if you get off, you know, faster. That was really questionable. I mean, I don't think that worked at all. But, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are ways to beat it. But again, you're absolutely correct. You have to know what you're doing, you know, you, uh, because uh, uh, and, and again, it depends on which steroid you're using. Some of them are, are you know, if you get off even a week before, you'll, you'll show up clean. And, you know, you're not going to lose all the gains you made in a week, so you still get the benefit. So you still right? get the benefit, and you can be the test, basically. Exactly, right. That's yeah, that's the problem. That's the main problem. Uh, is, the blood, is the blood test more, uh, more accurate than the urine test in, in, I when it comes so. to steroids? I, I definitely think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's more expensive, too. And, and a lot more expensive. Of course. You know, yeah, they're not going to go to the blood test. It's too. Now, it's, you know, it's very interesting. Like, a few years ago, they used to give a, a polygraph test. Right, right. That that used to make me laugh because the polygraph test is the easiest test to beat. Is it easy? I, I don't know. So I, I hear some people say it's impossible to beat the polygraph test. Some people say it's easy. <laughs> if you know, if you know how to do it, if you know what the test looks for, mm -hmm. it can be beaten. I mean, again, you have to know what you're doing. I mean, right. if you come in dumb, <laughs> you're gonna fail. You know what I mean? Right. It, it goes by your respiration, your uh, sweating pattern. Uh, there's a number of things it looks for, uh, and, you know. And if you know. Uh, how to put your mind in, let's say, the right uh, setting uh, is the best way to put it. You can beat it. And it takes some discipline to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's e It's not super easy. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, once you know what you're doing, it, it can actually be beaten. It's a very inaccurate way to test for drugs. It's very, I, thought it was kind of, I thought it was very awkward to do that, right? Like a, like a polygraph test. <laughs> Just so strange. And that's why they don't accept it in, in, uh, in legal, uh, in, in court. Because mm -hmm. it's it's not accurate enough to be accepted as evidence. Mm -hmm. So it, all it does is give you a trend. Mm -hmm. Like in legal in legal circles, they'll uh, you know they'll they'll uh, if a guy is suspected of murdering his wife, you know they'll they'll put him on a pol they say well, you want are you willing to take a polygraph test? The guys say yeah sure, you know and uh, they'll take the polygraph and you know they'll ask him a couple of things they know you know is correct like uh, what's sure. your name how old you are mm -hmm. that, you know to set that and that's way that's how they set the standard. In other words, they look at the graph, so then when he lies, they'll see the thing jump. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So they may, they'll ask him a couple of neutral questions, and then they'll add, I, I don't know where they'll say, did you kill your wife? Right? Now, if the guy knows how to beat the test, he'll, he'll say no. And sure enough, it'll be a flat, you know, you won't get the spike. But in most cases, you know, especially, see, they're tricky. They'll, you know, a good, uh, let's say, uh, examiner will know, he'll kind of feel the person out mm -hmm. and know when to hit him with the hard question. In other words, they get they try and get you by surprise mm -hmm. because, even, because even if you've mentally prepared yourself for the polygraph, if you're caught by surprise, it can, you know, you, you can't, you react too fast. Right, right, right. So like the guy will ask him 20 questions that were all neutral and then he'll say, uh, did you kill your wife? And the guy will say, oh, no, and, and but you know, it shocked him. So the spike goes up. Mm -hmm. So, but the public is saying he's guilty. Unfortunately, it can't be used in court. That's it's problem. just a very strange way to do it for steroids. I always felt like it was kind of weird when I found out that was. I thought it was weird. But isn't it true that let's say if you drink uh, vinegar right uh, before the urine test, you give a urine test, it yeah. skews the results. 
now the vinegar is very acidic. It's acetic acid. But uh, as far as I know, it doesn't. That, that's a kind of mm -hmm. myth. It's a myth, okay. You know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, yeah. There's like a lot of things that they talk about online. I've seen some of these forums uh, about how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> true. <laughs> Say is good luck to you, pal. You right, know, right. Right. Say you know, then it go for it. Yeah. All right, so I want it, it'll burn your throat out, but right, I mean, right, right, right. <laughs> All right, Jerry, I want to ask you uh, one more thing. As we've been talking for a while, actually, I want to ask you one more thing. So, um, now you you can you consider yourself a guru in bodybuilding? I don't like to use the word. You know, people call me that, but I I feel funny being called that because a guru, if you look at the definition. It's somebody who knows everything, basically. And I would never say that about myself. I, I, I do not know everything, and I'm constantly learning. I always tell people that uh, one of the reasons I love to do my, my newsletter is because in the course of research, just researching, I learn new stuff all the time that I didn't know. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the brain is amazing. It soaks up so much information. You, you, there's never a time when learning stops. Sure. In other words, I, the one thing that's consistent about me, and I told this to a friend of mine the other day, I change a lot of my I like I'm not I'm not a hardcore bodybuilder anymore. I'm just training now for health and this and that. My attitudes about a lot of things have changed. But the one thing that's been consistent about me since I was four years old, all the way till now, is a love of learning and a love of reading. I've never changed. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so in other words, again, people will call me guru and I always cringe because a lot of people are offended by that. And that's what bothers me. A lot well, of it, it, it seems like in bodybuilding guru became like a bad word. You know what I mean? It's like um, I know. I want to. Yeah. I want to get your take on that. I want to get your opinion on gurus. That because obviously, when when let's say a bodybuilder goes to a guru, right? Uh, they consider him to be the pinnacle of knowledge, right? And they trust the opinion of a guru. So they take directions, whether it's training, yeah. supplementation, and of course steroids, right? They they follow that that the protocol basically, right? Yeah. Um, do you feel like the guru has responsibility for the athlete's health in a situation like where the athlete hires him and they work together on something? Or, I, I mean, on, on building a physique, I mean. I definitely do. Because if this so-called guru is giving him information that could be, let's say, uh, have a negative health aspect, you know, the guru ha has to basically take responsibility. If the athlete is listening to everything he says, and I, I can tell you that they do, because when I worked with, for example, uh, they didn't call me a guru, but I was a nutritionist to uh, about 15 professional boxing champions, mm -hmm. and then including Oscar De La Hoya, among others, in the 90s. And uh, m one of the things I did is give them food supplements, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I would just hand them the supplements, and none of them ever questioned me. No, none of them ever said, well, Jerry, what is this red pill? What does this thing do? They follow no. your word, right? Yeah, they figured, well, you know, he knows what he's doing and uh, he's helping me and I'm not going to question. And that's the way the bodybuilders are. So, you know, the, the guru, uh, if you want to call him that, the guru has to take the responsibility. If, for example, if he's telling him to take, let's say, large amounts of Trenbolone, uh, if that's one of his, uh, uh, you know, his advisories, he has to take responsibility if something happens to the guy. Or, or I, I heard rumors that, and I don't want to, again, mention names, but one of the bodybuilders who passed away was I was taking massive amounts of testosterone mm -hmm. uh, based on the advice of a guru, and you know he died. Uh, you know, and it's difficult to you know to, to say cause and effect. You can't say well that much testosterone is what ki directly killed him. You know, in other words, he, he could have had underlying heart problems. Mm -hmm. This particular guy it turns out had a g genetic tendency to heart disease. His family, a lot of them had heart disease, but you know, mm -hmm. so it may or may not have had an effect. But the point is that. Uh, the guru has to take the response. If he's telling him to take that those kind of uh, drugs or mm -hmm. eat a certain way or whatever, he's got to be willing to monitor the guy, make sure the guy has the lab tests, medical checks and all that. It is a respons responsibility. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, even though the athlete voluntarily took this stuff, uh, you know, if anything happens to the athlete, uh, let's say a toxic effect, mm -hmm. it's on the guru because the guru, the guru could say, well, hey, wait a minute, you know, I didn't put a gun to his head. You know, I just told him what to take, and he took it. Yeah, but buddy, he took it because you told him to take it. Sure. So he wouldn't have had this heart attack if you didn't tell him to take it. So yes, it is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the answer to that question. Now I, I I know you're always doing research, and you're always very detailed in your research, and your, and your newsletter is amazing. You've you've constantly learning it. You're adapting new techniques. Now I, I've been talking to a, a couple of doctors recently, right? And they all kind of saying that they, they all 
saying to the gurus, you know what I mean? You guys are not knowledgeable. You're not, you're not doctors. They take credibility away from them, right? Yeah. So when you hear that, I don't know if they, they ever told you something like this or if you ever heard that criticism, but how do you feel about doctors when they start saying that you guys, not you specifically, but guys in the, in the fitness industry have no proper education or credibility to be able to work with these substances, you know what I'm saying? Or give any type of real advice to the bodybuilders because because the gurus are not doctors, you know what I'm saying? So I'm sure you heard this debate before. How do you how do you feel about it? Very simple answer to that. And uh, this is, uh, uh, here's the problem with that. Uh, the reason why the bodybuilders turn to the gurus is because, I know this sounds funny, most medical doctors don't know jack the only way I could say it, about steroids and anabolic drugs. They know nothing. They know, and, and they will not give advice out. They're going to tell the bodybuilders it's all dangerous, it's going to give you prostate cancer, it's going to give you heart disease. They're not the people to ask. So they turn to the gurus because they figure, well, this guru, he's worked with this guy, that guy, and that guy. They've won the contest. He must know what he's doing. He must know how to give out the steroids. Sure. The doctors are correct in one, in one aspect uh, in, in the sense that if something is going south health-wise to the body able to work with the guru, the guru is, is helpless because he can't diagnose the illness, he can't treat the guy, and that can really get out of hand where the guy can wind up hospitalized or, in a worst-case scenario, dead. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're right. But in other words, uh, uh, doctors are not the ones to ask about. I was shocked a couple of years ago. I was, I was naive. I, an endocrinologist is a doctor who specializes in hormones. I figured that if anyone knows about steroids, anabolics, it would be the endocrinologist. Right. I had occasion to go to one. I had a little slight medical problem. And, and <laughs> what happened was, I'll tell you what happened. I was taking a, te uh, a testosterone booster over the counter. This guy who, who gave it to me told me that it doesn't cause any side effects. And I wound up getting a case of gynecomastia, you know, which is- What is know, that? A little bit of breast formation, and I oh. went to an endocrinologist. You know, my hormones were all thrown completely off. You know, oh. <laughs> but I laugh about it. That wasn't funny at the time, because <laughs> the doc, they told me that I had the testosterone level of a twelve-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> but the wow. thing is, uh, the thing is that wait, so the testosterone booster stopped you producing testosterone? Completely cut off my own testosterone production. Completely, wow. completely cut it off. And I didn't know this was going on. See, I trusted the guy. The guy said that it wouldn't have caused any side effects, you know. Mm. But and by the way, this guy was a guru himself, you know. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, uh, so I said to this endocrinologist, you know, we were, I was talking to him. Mm -hmm. Now he went to Harvard Medical School. This guy was a top guy, and I started talking about the steroids and asking him a couple of questions. I didn't say anything about me writing for the man. I just acted like I was, you know, he, I, I looked like an average bodybuilder. You know, obviously I wasn't Mr. Olympia. You know. He could see I worked out. So I was asking him, uh, uh, you know, what about this uh, Wenstrol and uh, uh, Decadra? And I was shocked to find, Vlad, the guy knew nothing. He, <laughs> I, I, said, I said, I remember saying, oh, well, tell me, how do, they, how do the anabolic steroids actually work? How do they actually build the muscle? You know what he said? He says, well, they retain protein. That was his answer. What? They retain protein? <laughs> That's not the answer. It doesn't, <laughs> the guy knew nothing. And I said to myself, this guy's a Harvard-trained endocrinologist. He's like supposed to be the top expert on hormones, and he knows nothing about steroids. What does that mean for the average GP or internal medicine? Nothing. Right. Right. They know nothing. So this answers your question. Do uh, doctors, uh, you know, well, I, I get something similar myself. I'm not a guru. I don't give out any st – I, 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 I get requests all the time. People email me, mm -hmm. body pills. They want me to write out a steroid, but I won't do it because of ethical reasons. Because first of all, I'm not a doctor. I can't prescribe. That's the first thing. Second thing is I don't know these guys. I don't even know what they look like. I don't know what their health pattern is. They might have something existing. If I tell them what to take and they get a heart attack or stroke, it's on me. I'm not going to take that chance. I don't even know how old they are. What if that's a 12-year-old guy writing? I'm going to tell them to take Trembolone and to – No. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. There's guys that do that, but I'm not one of them, right? But you know, taking that into account, uh, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, of these a lot of these guys with advanced degrees, not necessarily MDs, but like, let's say PhDs, where they say uh, never listen to anybody who doesn't have an advanced degree, like a PhD, or when it comes to nutrition, 
only go to registered dietitians. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to these uh, these armchair philosophers who think they know stuff because uh, you know if they don't have the advanced degree, they they go, they know nothing. They say yeah. it like that. I personally I, I get very annoyed at that because first of all, a lot of these guys have degrees. Like there's one guy who talks a lot about nutrition. He has a degree in exercise physiology. That means he knows a lot about exercise, but that doesn't mean he's a nutrition expert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These guys do that. And and what they're saying is that a guy like me, who is independently on my own, studying nutrition for no less than 57 years, I don't know anything and somebody shouldn't listen to me? Are you kidding me? Please. I, I, I will I will dance circles around any one of these guys. And I'm not trying to <laughs> you know arrogant when I say that. Absolutely, it, of course. I'm saying it's just a stupid it's a broad statement to say that you should only listen to to somebody within it. And again, these guys are intelligent. I, I credit them for earning the degrees, but to say that they're an expert in everything and they know everything is absolutely nonsense. I mean, I, I've had arguments with some of these guys, uh, well, not personally, but they make statements like, carbohydrates don't make you fat. And I'd say to them, well, could you, could you explain that statement? In other words, are you saying any amount of carbohydrates will not make a person fat? Absolutely. It's all, they're all oxidized in the liver. Any excess carbohydrates, I said, oh, is that right? Then explain to me why when I eat carbohydrates, even if I'm not eating an excess amount of calories, I get fat or I can't lose fat. What's going on? I'm a, I'm a human being. It's in the textbooks. Why, you know? And they, you know what? They can't explain that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They can't explain that. They just say, well, according to this, don't give me the according to crap. Like, get away from your ivory tower and look in the real world. Mm -hmm. Most people are fat because they eat too much sugar and carbohydrates. And the truth is most people are fat not just carbohydrates, they eat carbohydrate and fat. Because when you eat a lot of carbohydrate and fat, what happens is the fat, which normally, would, let's say, might be burned up, because you're getting the most accessible form of energy, which is carbohydrate, the excess fat you eat goes right into your fat stores, right like an express route. So most people are obese today because of two reasons. They eat too much carbohydrate and fat and because they don't exercise. If they work out a lot, they neutralize that. But a lot of them don't. That's why they're getting fatter and fatter and fatter. People are getting fatter. They're not getting thinner. They're getting fatter. <laughs> Jerry, man, we talked for an hour and a half, man. I really, I really appreciate it, man. That was, you know, always a pleasure talking to you, man. I'm so glad that we, we did it again, man. It's been a while. Good to talk to you, Vlad. Always good to see you. <laughs> it's great to see you, man. Stay, uh, stay safe out there. Stay healthy. You too.